Hello, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Thanks so much for joining our webinar today. My name is Kate Moraris, and I'm the Senior Program Director at the Hepatitis B Foundation. The Hepatitis B Foundation is a co-lead of Hepi United, a national coalition of 17 coalitions working towards the elimination of Hepatitis B. On behalf of Hepi United, I wanted to thank you for joining us today for this webinar entitled Hepatitis B Data Collection and Management. As a collaborative effort with the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, we're really excited to present you with today's webinar about the importance of data collection in interventions to reduce and eliminate hepatitis B. Joining us as your presenters today are Dr. Alex Serpipatina, Chief of the Data Branch at the Bureau of Primary Health Care at the Health Resources and Services Administration at the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Henry Roberts, a statistician from the Surveillance Branch of the Centers for Disease Control Division of Viral Hepatitis, and Ms. Aurora Wong, Coordinator for Hepi Free Las Vegas, a partner of Hepi United. Before we get started, I wanted to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's webinar. Please note that all attendees are in listen-only mode and will be muted during the presentations. You may submit questions in writing during the presentation by typing them in the questions field on your bottom left-hand corner. And Please indicate to whom the question is directed, or you can direct your questions to all presenters. We will be reviewing them as they come in, and we'll have a Q&A period after the presentations. Today's webinar is being recorded, recorded, and you will receive an email with a link to, to view a recording of today's presentation after the webinar. Lastly, before I pass the meeting over, I also wanted to quickly tell you a little bit about the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and HEPI United, the co-hosts for this event. The API population represents the fastest growing racial and ethnic minority group in the U.S. And in the next 40 years, the API population will more than double to reach almost 36 million. President Obama reauthorized, reauthorized the White House Initiative on APIs in order to reflect this growth, to understand what they mean and address these challenges. The mission of the White House on API initiative is to work with all of the agencies of the federal government to improve the health, education, and economic status of API communities. The initiative has five major focus areas, one being healthy communities, and the goal is to improve the API overall health outcomes by reducing health risks, improving access to quality health care, and promoting healthy living. HEPI United is a national coalition to address the public health challenge of hepatitis B, the leading cause of liver cancer, and a major health disparity among Asian Americans. Our goal is to support and leverage the success of local community coalitions across the U.S. to increase Hep B awareness, screening, vaccination, and linkage to all Americans and API populations. And the purpose of this webinar and future webinars is to highlight priorities in the field of hepatitis B. We hope these webinars will provide you with new insights and tools that you can use locally, regional, as well as nationally. And with that, I'll turn the meeting over to Dr. Alex Sipropatana, Chief of the Data Branch at HRSA's Bureau of Primary Health Care. Alex? Hi. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, and, and thank you for inviting me a part of this very important webinar. Um, can you hear me okay? I just want to double check. Yes. Okay, yes, we can great. hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. And and um, I just want to let people know that that screen, that face shot that you see, I'm actually taller and skinnier than denoted there. <laughs> um, in any case, I, I, I do want to talk about um, our data collection strategies uh, around hepatitis B here at the Bureau of Primary Health Care. We have two basic data collection strategies, um, one that's uh, data submitted from healthcare provider data, and that's from our uniform data system, and we've also got uh, patient-level data from our patient survey. Uh, so let me first just describe our uniform data system data, or UDS. Um, the uniform data system is a core set of information appropriate for reviewing the operation and performance of our uh, health centers, uh, community health centers. Um, it's, it's a pretty robust data collection system, but I'm glad to include that we're, we, we look for information um, as it relates to hepatitis B. The UDS uh, tracks a variety of information, including patient demographics, uh, services provided by the health centers, health center staffing, 
uh, clinical indicators, utilization rates, costs, and revenues. Um, the UDS the UDS data are annually collected from health center programs, which include program grantees and lookalikes, as defined in Section 330 of the Public Health Service Act. Um, these these UDS data represent over 1,200 grantees, 9,000 delivery sites, and about 22 million patients. The data are reviewed to ensure compliance with legislative and regulatory requirements, improve health center performance and operations, and report overall program accomplishments. The data help to identify trends over time, enabling HRSA to establish or expand targeted programs and identify effective services and interventions to improve the health of underserved communities and vulnerable populations. UDS data are compared with national data to review differences between the U.S. population at large and those individuals and families who rely on the health care safety net for primary care. UDS data also inform health center programs, partners, and communities about patients served by health centers. So that being said, um, how are Hep B data reported into the UDS? So the number of clinical visits that are Hep B related and number of patients um, with a Hep B diagnosis are collected in our system through International Statistical Classification of Diseases Codes, or ICD-9, uh, ICD-10 codes. Um, we also collect the number of tests, uh, Hep B tests provided over the past year, and that's through current procedural terminology, or CPT codes. Um, so looking back at this, the UDS data, I could see uh, identified trends like... Um, uh, for last year's data, or 2012 data, um, South Cove Community Health Center in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, provided about 9% of Hep B tests to their patient population. They've also seen nearly uh, 7% of their patient population have a Hep B diagnosis. Um, I, I can also tell you that at Charles B. Wang Community Health Center in New York, nearly one in five of their patients have received a Hep B test. So it's about 18%. And so these these occurrences aren't surprising given the fact that the patient populations at these two health centers, both South Coast Community Health Center and Charles B. Wang, have nearly 95% of their patient population are Asian American or Pacific Islander. Um, I also want to talk to you about our other data collection strategy for Hep B, and that's through our Health Center Patient Survey. Uh, unlike the UDS, these data are collected every four to five years by the Bureau. And unlike the UDS, they're not pulled from clinical chart data or electronic health records. They're actually um, data collected from a sample-based survey of our health center patients through face-to-face -face patient interviews. Um, but the thing that's nice about the health center patient survey is that the although the number of patients aren't as large, they, it's a sample-based survey, the level of granularity in which we can collect information is more in depth. Um, in the Health Center Patient Survey, we collect information on diagnoses, uh, history of diagnoses, uh, history of vaccination, testing, where in fact patients are receiving care, testing, vaccination, so we have a better sense of uh, the, the, the care and preventative nature of our patient population. And I'm very proud uh, to share with you that in our next iteration of the Health Center Patient Survey, which is set to hit the field in late summer, early fall of 2014, um, for the first time ever, we're actually going to oversample for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, historically, we haven't had enough um, sample size to provide any sort of in-depth um, look at our Asian Americans and Pacific Islander patients uh, from the patient survey. This is great. And in fact, um, new for this 
wave of the survey, we were actually conducting it in uh, a handful of Asian languages. Historically, it had only been conducted in English and in Spanish. So um, the 2014 Health Center patient survey will include um, the, the survey being fielded in Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, and Korean. Uh, so this is the first time ever, and we suspect that we'll have a better understanding <coughs> of these patient population groups uh, as a result of this survey. So that's sort of just a quick skim of our data collection strategies, and I hope to talk more in depth about some of the implications of this data during the Q&A period. So I'll pass it back to you, Kate. Thank you, Alec. Um, next, I'd like to introduce our um, Dr. Henry Roberts. Dr. Roberts, are, are you on the line yet? Hi. Hello. Hello. Can you hear us? Uh, Kate, I can hear you. Perfect. We can hear you, too. Okay, great. Uh, on behalf of the CDC Division of Hepatitis, I also would like to just thank you for giving us this opportunity. And when you think of um, hepatitis surveillance, just think of those units at the national, state, and local level that are tasked with monitoring viral hepatitis, infection rates, mortality rates, the utilization of certain laboratory tests and treatments, and also tasked with monitoring uh, hospitalization rates in the United States. Viral hepatitis is among 70 conditions currently listed on the notifiable disease list. Acute hepatitis A, B, and C are on that list. Perinatal hepatitis B was actually added in January of 2002. Chronic hepatitis B and C were added in 2003. Currently, 43 states report chronic hepatitis B infections to the CDC, and 41 states report chronic hepatitis C infections to the United States. To, I'm sorry, to the CDC. The next slide illustrates the flow of viral hepatitis surveillance data to the CDC. So, as you can see, hospital, commercial, clinical laboratories as well as healthcare providers report those infections first to their local health departments, which in turn then report those infections to their state health department. And if those infections meet what we call the CSTE criteria, then those are considered confirmed cases, and those are transmitted to the CDC on a weekly basis. The following four to five slides just kind of restate the case definitions for acute, chronic, and perinatal hepatitis B. You can see here for acute hepatitis B, there are two components, a laboratory component and a clinical component. To be considered what we call a confirmed case, that patient must meet both components. So per se, the laboratory criteria states that a person having a hepatitis B service antigen positive result and also having met the clinical component, which means that they have symptoms consistent with viral hepatitis, would be considered a confirmed case of acute hepatitis B. The chronic hepatitis B case is similar with the exception that we have relaxed the clinical component. So if the person does not have a presentation of symptoms and they meet this laboratory component, meaning that they have a negative IgM antibody hepatitis B test and a positive hepatitis B service antigen test or one of those other two, then we can consider those to be chronically infected with hepatitis B. The perinatal case definition only pertains to those that are of the age less than 24 months. So a confirmed case is defined as hepatitis B surface antigen positive in any infant less than or equal to 24 months who was born in the U.S. or in a U.S. territory 
to a Hep B surface antigen positive mother. So those are the case definitions that are considered to be the standard that we report on at the CDC. Primarily we have our surveillance system is called the NED system. And in reporting cases to the CDC, each state health department has their version of the NEDS or some type of NEDS compatible system. And what we do, we ask them to make sure that they're transmitting several core basic types of information about each case. So each case must have demographic information, the case status, whether or not the person has acute hep A, acute hep B, acute hep C, so on and so forth. And also we ask them to ensure that the date that the case was reported is also included as a record. So in addition, for those states who have the resources, we also ask them to transmit enhanced or extended data, which could consist of clinical data, laboratory results, and results from certain risk factors. So we use these data, the NEDS data, to help us monitor trends in the incidence of acute hepatitis, A, B, and C, really, and also to identify those that are infected persons and at risk of infecting someone else. These data are also used to evaluate and guide prevention efforts. So some of our deliverables from using these data, we produce an annual surveillance summary, which can be located on our website. We have several peer-reviewed publications. And also we collaborate with some of our state colleagues to help produce state policy and documents. As with any surveillance system, there's going to always be limitations. Some of the limitations for our NETS surveillance system is just by the mere nature of the disease. Underreporting has been an issue. We have statistical methodologies that allow us to try to account or adjust underreporting. The completeness of a record is also an issue. And in some cases, misclassification of those diseases or failure to correctly apply the case definition is a limitation for those data that we receive from our state colleagues. To help supplement our data, we use several sources. Among those are the NHANES, also known as the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. The NHANES data are, are collected using a multi-stage probability sample. It consists of U.S. civilian non-institutionalized population, it includes interviews as well as physical exams and blood samples. Those data are used to help us measure the prevalence of hepatitis A, B, and C by social demographic characteristics. And in the following slide, we have here some publications. Uh, there was Clevelands and all that measured the prevalence of hepatitis A. Uh, Washley and all has also been um, heavily cited that reports the prevalence of hepatitis B. And here we have a new article by Denston et al. that measures the prevalence of hepatitis C. So even with one of our flagship surveillance systems like NHANES, there are also limitations as well. So with the NHANES, unfortunately, we cannot produce state-level estimates. And they're not considered to be entirely representative of the U.S. high-risk population. And sample size has also been a huge limitation with using those data. So last, I just want to just kind of recap here the, the mission of our team. So we have a hepatitis surveillance team here within the Division of Hepatitis, and we are tasked with developing, evaluating, and maintaining surveillance systems with our colleagues throughout the United States. So we provide consulta consultation, training, technical assistance. We also help with the dissemination of information through publications. And we provide training opportunities for our ES, EIS officers. So on, again, on behalf of the Division of Hepatitis, we want to thank you for 
allowing us to share some of what we do within the division. And I also would like to just take questions perhaps during that particular time. So, Kate, back to you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. It's really great information. Um, really provides a good lay of the land across the country of how the CDC and the federal government has been collecting um, your statistics. I now want to introduce, uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Ms. Aurora Wong. Aurora is the coordinator for Happy Free Las Vegas. Um, HBFLV was launched in February of 2011 in response to a fast-growing API population and the lack of accessible and culture and linguistic appropriately appropriate Hep B screening services for low-income, underserved, or limited English proficient APIs. Technology plays an important role in this coalition's focus on client follow-up. Um, it uses a unique encrypted electronic database management system, which Aurora will be speaking with us, um, demoing for us. So we're very glad that she's joining us today to demo it, and I'll turn it over to Aurora. Um, thank you, Kate, and thank you, everyone, uh, for your time. I noticed that there are 16 people um, who are phoning in, so you won't uh, be able to actually uh, see the demonstration. Um, but in any event, uh, Mimi2 is an encrypted, real-time, web-accessible data management system, and it was designed specifically for hepatitis B screening and um, client follow-up, whether that be vaccination or linkage to care. The security features, which I put up front because anyone managing a real-time um, database has to worry about that, is uh, that the software was written, and when it was written, it was encrypted with 256-bit uh, encryption. The standard is 128. Uh, we have an SSL certification. Um, the access to the website is controlled. The level of access is also controlled. So you can get into the website if you have a password, but where you can go in the website is controlled. And then there's the um, possible and immediate denial of access uh, at any time. Um, now, uh, on the front end, at a screening event, you can, and I have, used uh, the software to do online client registration, and I'll demonstrate that for you very shortly. And this eliminates the need to have the client uh, fill out the one or two page application form that you have. If you end up having to do paper um, applications because your clientele is not English reading, you know, is LEP or NEP, uh, then they fill out the forms, but you could have near simultaneous data entry at that event so that by the close of the event, you've got everyone um, in the database. In both cases, you still need to have the paper copies of the consent to procedure and the authorization for release of um, health protected information. So that's at the screening. After the screening, you input the test results, and once you've got that in there, you are able to start tracking based on what those test results are. You can track uh, because you want to facilitate vaccination or offer vaccination, and you can track um, linkage to care. Um, the database is wonderful because it allows you to uh, generate your reports for follow-up. So you can generate reports on the uh, particular screening event. You can take a look at just those needing um, vaccine. So for example, um, that's what I do, and I generate a report of all the non-immune. I send that immediately to the Southern Nevada Health District because they are my vaccination agency. They have then a picture of how many they can expect to walk in the door at any time with the Hep B free letter, which then allows them to receive the vaccine uh, for free. And then I also like to give a heads up of the number of positives and the demographics on the positives um, to the clinics that I work with. I work with a free clinic 
and then a sliding scale clinic, and that gives them a heads up of the number of people that they're likely that I'm going to be bringing to them um, within seven days. And then you can look at anything else you want to look at. Uh, you can report, you can generate reports for analysis, anything you want to look at. Uh, um, uh, I get phone calls all the time wanting to know in the APA population that I deal with what is the uninsured rate, and I can pop that up really, really easily. Um, uh, it also allows me to give evidence-based um, feedback to my coalition partners, and that's really important. Um, but they get my my nice graphs and the statistics, and they feel very engaged with what we're doing um, and uh, continue to support it. So the health district gets very excited. Um, uh, volunteers in medicine, they get very excited. The pharmacy school here, uh, they are my source of language speaking volunteers. And, uh, you know, I can't do enough screenings to satisfy their uh, need to send students out to these types of events. The lab, which gives me cost plus one dollar for the tests that they run for me, um, they get to see the demographics and it makes them feel good that they're serving the underserved population. And then the temples, uh, for example, where I will do a screening, they always get very excited to see, uh, you know, the, the ethnic breakout um, of who was served on that particular day. Um, let's see. Mimi, too, in a community-based organization program, which is what I am. I don't operate out of a clinic, so you never hear me use the word patient. You hear me use the word client. Um, if, if, if you are out there, let's say, um, Vietnamese American um, Foundation, and you're not set up as a clinic, if you wanted, but you do a lot of screenings, um, and you wanted to start tracking people and being able to collect data above and beyond a, an Excel spreadsheet, um, you would need some form of uh, um, uh, cyber liability insurance. You would have to have a designated data administrator. You'd have to have um, access to na native language speakers and really good relationships with the communities you serve and with the clinics that you work with in terms of linkage to care. Um, and that's basically uh, the, the PowerPoint. Now, what is in front of you? Do you see, um, has your screen changed? Hello, Kate? Uh, no, not yet. Oh, oh I, you know what? I forgot to click share. There we go, share. And I want to do full screen. Okay. Just wait a few moments. Bring up the content. All right. Now has your screen changed? Yes. Okay, great. All right. This is uh, the demonstration test site. And I said earlier at the front end, you could do online registration or you could do simultaneous um, data entry as you get the um, forms from the person who's completed them. And it's very, very quick. Uh, this is where you would give instructions to the staff who's going to be doing this. I'm just going to quite quickly go through this. We're going to have Hepi United. C is our new patient, and your last name is C, and your social security number is this, and your date of birth is this. Katie, your address is A, your city is A, your zip code is 89113. Um, your mobile phone is. And your 
female, you're divorced, let's make you Samoan, let us, you speak English, speak English, and Samoa, born in Samoa, and let's have you born in Guam, and don't have to put your year of entry into the United States because Guam is a U.S. territory. I'm not pregnant. There's two of us. I'm not sure. No one ever knows that they got their Hep A. And they rarely remember their Hep B. And they don't know. And they don't know. And not sure. Um, and I'm not sure, but I remember hearing that someone said grandma had it. Um, yes, someone did have liver cancer, no insurance, and a medical provider, no. Okay. All right, so now we're going to look for this person that we just entered, and let's keep your fingers crossed. I think we call him Hep B United C, and there he is. Okay, so that's how quickly uh, a registration um, goes. And, uh, you know, I kind of breeze through it. It does take a little longer because you've got to read the answers to their questions or you're, you're talking to them. But that's, at, you know, any time during your screening event, you can simply go to the registry this is trying to do, you can go to your registration package, your event, and you can see what you've got. So it's real time. Okay. Um, now let's talk about how we uh, control access to this. You have your users, and this is where the data administrator comes in. And um, these are all the users who have had access. If they're red, they've been disabled. If they are not red, uh, they are current and they have usernames and passwords and can get into the system. Um, so you just add whoever you want. There's a type of access. This will limit them. So if you have volunteers that are just doing registration, they get that designation. They can see nothing else but the registration package that they are allowed to see, which goes in this field over here. Um, the doctor, I have a doctor who does HEP B screening um, automatically, and this is his designation, and all he can see in the database is his, whatever he put in his um, swimming pool. And then these are the higher level. The system administrator has the source code and data administration coordinator um, have much higher uh, levels. They can contr they control the administration panel here. Okay, now let's take a look at, uh, let's find a client. Um, and I don't care what package he's in, but I want to see all my positives. And you do that and you can um, export, you can generate a file on these six that'll come out like an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, let's take a look at this person. And this person is positive, and you'll see under linkage to care that this person has been linked to volunteers in medicine. The eligibility appointment was in January 10th, and the doctor appointment was on this date. Now, of course, this assumes you want to stay actively involved in the linkage to care aspect. The way uh, we do it here in Las Vegas, if they're positive and uninsured, we get them through the eligibility process at Volunteers in Medicine, which is a totally free clinic. And they take over uh, their care. And we end up staying very closely in touch because we end up setting all of the appointments for volunteers in medicine with the with our um, clients. Okay, um, let me show you a client who is uh, a vaccine situation. 
we click on that. Let's see. And let's pick uh, Mimi Chang. And you'll see that um, she has all three shots. Um, why is that relevant? Because that means we'll never call her to go and get a shot. Let's take a look at our clients. I don't care about the ethnicity. From the swimming pool of all the people who are not immune, I want to find everyone who's gotten one shot because that means that'll tell me if they're due for a second shot. In that swimming pool, there's only one person who's had one shot. That means that he will, this person will pop up when we do our next event that has a vaccine component to it. And all of our screening events include a vaccine component. In any event, okay. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the results from my database. Um, you won't see any names. You're just going to see aggregate um, data. But let's go to uh, ethnic results. Yeah, okay. In the entire swimming pool that I have, there are 305 Chinese, and do you see the breakout of the number of people in the and their test results? Okay. So that's the Chinese. Um, here's the Filipino. Uh, there have been 818 Filipinos screened, and this is the results. NA means not available, and these are from the screenings that are done in the doctor's office, Dr. Ben Calderon's office. There's a two-week lag time since I never get his test results. There's a two-week lag time before I get those, before he puts those test results into um, Mimi two. So there's always a certain number that is, we don't know what their test results are. Uh, let's see. Native Hawaiian, not a lot. 28. And this was after I participated in a two-day Native Hawaiian festival and could only get 28 Native Hawaiians to come in to the booth to get screened all others were all other nationalities. Um, let me show you Vietnamese. And for Vietnamese, I've screened 365, and we have one that's outstanding. So that occurred in, that is one of Dr. Ben's patients, and the rest is that. So, um, okay. So I think I'm pretty much done, and I'll just, if you have any questions, I mean, it takes forever to kind of go through this. It just depends on what you want to know. But it's a very flexible uh, system. You can, um, you can pretty much program your own questions. You can set up your own registration package. You can do letters from this, and then there's a command to print the letters and insert the addresses. Um, if you want to see who's been checking out your database, who's, got, who's gone into it, you have an audit trail. And anyone who ever logs in, so you'll see, let's find Daniel had been in it the other day. So there he is. Okay. Um, and it tells you what they did when they were in your um, database. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Aurora. That's a really amazing system you have. Um, we do have a lot of questions that have come in over the chat box. Um, so we'll now begin the Q&A portion of the webinar. As mentioned at the beginning of the call, we'll start answering questions submitted to us via the chat function. And if you do have a question, please submit them now. Um, please do so. The questions, the chat box is on your lower left-hand corner of your screen. Um, the first question that we have is from uh, Chrissy Chung, and I believe this is for 
Dr. Roberts. Um, the question is, why do only 43 or 41 states report HPV and HCV rates? Um, what about the other states? Yeah, so unfortunately for hepatitis, most of our surveillance partners, they're not funded to conduct hepatitis surveillance. So some states, if resources are an issue, they will not have the capacity to conduct the type of follow-up investigations that are required to ascertain whether or not that infection is indeed a confirmed case of chronic or acute hepatitis B. And the funding comes from the state, and so it's, uh, in other words, it's a state priority? Yes, it most certainly is. So it's, it's on the state end. So we would love for those states to all report their chronic and acute cases to the CDC, but it has been a strain on state budgets for some of those programs to have the labor or the personnel that are required to conduct thousands upon thousands of investigations per year. I see. Do you actually have a listing of those states that do report? Uh, we, we do, and I think that okay. is also on our website. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is for Alec. Alec, uh, the question is from um, Cherry. How does uh, your department, um, the Bureau of Primary Health Care, or HRSA, use and disseminate the data that you do collect through uh, either UDS or the other surveys that you've mentioned? Sure. Uh, we actually have um, our, UD our BIPIC UDS data, data uh, website pages, so you can actually uh, see our data from the national level, uh, a state level aggregate, or by uh, HRSA Green T or lookalike. Um, we also have other dissemination points. Um, we've published our analytical findings using UDS data and or the Health Center Patient Survey in various uh, peer-reviewed journals. And those are also the actual journal titles, authors, um, and potential links are all, you can also find from our uh, Bureau of Primary Health Care website. Great. Thank you. And we'll, we'll share your websites with um, all the participants after the sure, webinar. Love, love that. And any feedback you can provide would be actually in the process of giving our websites um, a little bit of, of facelifts. I mean, they're, they, they, we're kind of trying to bring them out of the, uh, the dark ages. Great. Um, the next question that we have is for Dr. Roberts. Uh, are any diseases mandatory for reporting and any chance that HBV will ever become mandatory? Yes. So all acute cases, acute hepatitis A, B, and C, by state mandate, are required to be reported to the CDC. Okay, but it's a different case for chronic. That is that is correct, right? It's just because it's so many. But right. to make sure that those individuals are receiving the appropriate care, and that the providers are following the guidelines as recommended by the CDC, we really push that the state our state colleagues report the acute cases to the CDC. Okay, thank you. Um, and the next question is for Aurora. Have you faced any barriers with using the technology platform at community screenings? For example, is it time prohibitive? Um, do you have many computers that you use, uh, that you have on hand at events to prevent long lines from forming? Uh, okay, it is not uh, time prohibitive uh, because I have language speaking uh, pharmaceutical students doing the uh, data collection or, or doing the online registration. So they're asking the questions in Vietnamese or Chinese or Thai, okay? For the, for, so the older people don't like it, so we have them do the paper applications, and they also are being guided by language-speaking uh, pharmacy students. I and it, it, it goes... It actually goes more quickly when you're doing it online than it does uh, with the paper. Okay. But once the paper is done, we simply hand that 
once the lab order is given to them, we take the uh, application form and the two consents and we give it to the data entry person. And, you know, after you do like a bunch of these, it's just automatic. Your fingers just fly. So, um, yeah. And it, it really is not time prohibitive. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and related to that, another question we have is, um, what is your recruitment strategy? Is this based at a clinic? Is it part of a regular clinic day? Uh, what do you mean by recruitment? You mean uh, for, for community screenings, I believe. Oh, okay. Well, I work uh, primarily um, now because after doing, trying every single, going to every single type of health fair and, and setting up a screening uh, booth. Um, what I found was to get really, really targeted, I needed to go where the population would go. And so I have three Buddhist temples, a Chinese, a Vietnamese, and a Thai that I work, work very, very closely with. So I do a lot of screenings um, at those uh, temples. There is a Chinese Christian Baptist church that is um, new to my portfolio. I've done one screening there and was thrilled with the clientele that showed up for it. So uh, I will start doing screenings at First Med. It's a community health center, and uh, they um, are very, very supportive of Hep B. And so we're going to start doing it at that clinic to see if people will go to a clinic that's not where they would normally go. Right. But before we do that, uh, I do advertise heavily in language. I will advertise for a whole month um, prior to a screening event in language in the Vietnamese newspaper, the Thai newspaper, and the Chinese newspaper. Okay. And then Thank I you. offer incentives. They cut off the bottom. They bring that. They get a $5 card to Walmart. Okay. Great. Um, and uh, we have folks that are actually interested in um, this software program. Um, how do they get the software program, and what are the costs associated with it? Okay. Well, the software is um, uh, is something that I had a software engineer um, design. He designed it in conjunction with Dr. Calderon, who runs the hepatitis B program in his clinic, and they kind of uh, went into um, eClinical uh, using kind of that as a template for how they were just going to focus on this one um, disease. So basically, it is my system. Um, and I am very happy to share it with anyone, uh, any um, CBO that wants to do it. But there are certain things that they're going to have to do. So, for example, you will need to have it customized to your program. And so there will be a small setup fee that you would pay to the um, engineer. Um, and he would do that, and then you would have to come up with a maintenance agreement with him. But I'll tell you, it, it's, it's dirt cheap. So my particular system, I have all these other fancier filters, uh, just because as I could see how powerful it was, I just wanted more and more bells and whistles in my system, and I would have to say, okay, can you do this? And he would do it. So. But, um, yeah, so that's the end. So contact me, uh, send me an email, and we can start the conversation. Great. We'll definitely connect you and provide your contact information to the, to the um, community organizations I, that are I, interested. Great. I've offered uh, this to you to give to all of their partners as well, who, yep. whoever may be interested. Yeah. Um, and just to, yeah, just to confirm, just related, is the web-based application HIPAA compliant? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Yes, 
the the compliance issues uh, uh, are addressed in the security measures. Um, where it becomes an issue is if you are a clinic and you have an EMR system, well, every clinic has an EMR system now, uh, the question for you is if you would want to run this separate or if you would want to set up an interface between this software and your EMR, HIPAA will not allow that interface. So you would have to run it as a separate internal program, and then you'd have to, I believe, keep it on your server. It could not be uh, web accessible. Okay. Um, yeah. And will we need to ever be open source? Um, probably not, uh, just because it costs me so much to uh, to uh, to have the software written, and it has not been standardized. Okay, so uh, mm -hmm. at some point uh, it it could be standardized, and then it becomes something like you know your your Word Perfect program or your Excel spreadsheet program. But you couldn't really make modifications on it. Yeah, that would be a nice goal to have. But um, you know, I'm I'm still in the trenches. So right, it's definitely you know. innovative what you're what you've been doing, and it would really be amazing to see the program, the software being used, and having that type of data um, aggregated across the country. Yeah. Well, when when we were first putting it together. Uh, the the ideal that I could see is that let's say ten different programs use this software, and then on some on uh, some magic date, they press they type in a command which de-identifies the data and puts it into a big swimming pool, which then CDC or whomever would you would give them access to it. So that you could have the entire data from Southwest participants, if you will, hmm. right then and there, and you'd have everything in it except name, rank, serial number, date of birth. Right. But you'd have all the demographics, you'd have all the diagnosis, you'd have vaccination records, and and each one would be art would be numbered, if you will, because they remove the old data and they they the identifying data, and the, it's just automatically numbered. So each record is intact, but CDC looking at it can't see the identifying information. Right. Great. And that would be kind of exciting. Yeah. And it would be so effortless because, you know. Yeah. Um, so finally, we have another final question, I believe, um, that's related to your screening events. Um, you had mentioned that clients get Free Hep B vaccine series. Uh, how do you find funding for this? Who funds this? Um, the the vaccines are paid for by the Southern Nevada Health District. So you can get a vaccine in from two places. You can come to our screening because the health district shows up at every screening we do. But the deal is we have to call everyone who's due for a vaccine and tell them to come. And then we give them the head count. So we'll say, yes, we called 90 people, 48 are confirmed to come. They will bring 48 plus five vaccine vials. Mm -hmm. And then they, they shoot them. And if they do that, it's absolutely free. They do not pay the $16 administrative fee. If the person chooses instead to go to the health district, they bring their notification letter from Hep B Free. And um, they are given red carpet treatment. They go to the front desk. The desk mm -hmm. calls one nurse who comes out, takes the client in. They fill out two forms, shoots them, gives them a card. They have to go pay the $16 admin fee because the shot was given at the health district. And that's the deal that we set up with the health district because um, they vaccinate uh, their vaccination rates for hepatitis B vaccine are just shooting up, and they're thrilled about that because they have gobs of the vaccine. And when our people, our clients show up, they know these are people 
who need the vaccine because the test result is attached to the letter. Right. So there's no waste of funds. They know this person needs the test, and they match the name of the person against the spreadsheet that I sent them, the, the report I sent them of all the um, non-immunes from whatever the screening was. Yeah. And to the person that asked that question, um, this is something that, you know, many of our coalition members are able to do, um, provides free vaccines or free screenings through a number of different ways. And we're more than happy to connect with you directly if that's something you'd uh, be interested in learning more about, if that's something that you're trying to do in your community, um, we'll be definitely be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, last call for questions. And I'm looking at the chat box. Um, I don't see any more questions, so we'll we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, if we were unable to answer any particular questions today, we will we've taken note of them, and we will um, get back in touch with you over email. Um, so the slide includes ways you can follow up with us. Please don't hesitate to contact us directly at this email, connect at happyunited.org. You can also learn more about Happy United and our members, um, like Aurora, on our website at happyunited.org or by following us on Facebook, Twitter, as well as YouTube. Lastly, I wanted to thank our presenters, Alex Sipropatina, Henry Roberts, and Aurora Wong. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day um, to um, tell us more about the work that you're doing. Um, thank you all for participating. Happy United will continue to have webinars in the months ahead. So please be on the lookout for information about future trainings on topics uh, such as health reform, such as the intersections with hepatitis B, stigma and advocacy, um, coalition building next month. Um, um, please keep a lookout for, for an email right after this webinar concludes, which will include materials from today's webinar and a link. Please take the time out to include to um, complete a sh very short survey so that we can improve um, our resources for you for the next time that we are able to engage with you. Thank you all again and have a great rest of the day.